My name is Eduardo R. Sanchez Jr. Uh, I was born in Laredo, Texas on November the 23rd, 1931. Mm -hmm. uh, what about your family background? Where are they from? Do you have any uh, siblings? On my mother's side, they came from uh, Old Guerrero, Mexico, and during the revolution of 1910 or 12, they came over to the United States. And uh, her name was Gutierrez de Lara, and there were the fourth generation uh, families that came from Spain. The King of Spain granted all those land grants to the to families, and, and, and Gutierrez de Lara was one of them. On my father's side, it's Sanchez, and he came from uh, Sabinas, Mexico, somewhere down there. A history on that one, I don't know very much, but the Gutierrez de Lara, it's a... Uh, on my mother's side, there were 14 in the family. Wow. So there were terraces all over the place. Yeah. Do you have any siblings? I, I, was, uh, I never got married. My sister has six daughters. My brother had four. And there are 50, there are 12 great grandchildren right now. And I think there's two in the way, if I'm not mistaken. Educational experience? I went to the public schools uh, first, second, and third grade. And then I transferred to St. Augustine, uh, it's a Catholic school. And I uh, graduated there in 1951. Mm -hmm. And right after I graduated, uh, the, the Korean workers started and the draft was, I know they were gonna get me because we were at that age. So we went to the recruiter there, we, me and my friend, we wanted to join the, uh, the Air Force. He says, well, the Air Force is closed, Army is open, Marines is open. So no, we don't want any of that. But the Navy is open. We took the exam and two, three days later, we're in San Diego for boot camp. So you enlisted and? Enlisted and, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, I enlisted for three years because at that time you could, uh, it was three years. Uh, that was it, the least. But then in 1953, the Korean War was really, really, that's when they were signing the truce and this and that and the other. And they said, well, you, you can't go out either. You're gonna to have to stay one more year or two more years. So I stayed another year, so actually I served five years. But it, it was really worth it because if it wouldn't have been for those five years, the government wouldn't have been paid for my education, which it took me five years to go to college and this and that and the other. After a year, I was transferred to the USS Sphinx. Uh, it's a small repair ship, and that one was great because uh, the crew was 225. We had about 10 officers and, and maybe 10 or chiefs or something like that. Well, anyway, that was a great duty. Both captains that we had were great, 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 great. They used to call us son. Hi, son, how you doing? And this and that and the other. And uh, in fact, I just came back from, a, like I told you, Branson, where we had a reunion, 25th reunion. And it's funny how, how this reunion started, started in 1990. And now you have a reunion instead. Yes. <laughs> and a uh, lot of memories, a lot of memories. Oh, I have albums and pictures and this and that and the other and everything. And once in a while I go back and look at the pictures and it's, it's a... Uh, it's amazing. I close my eyes and I see the faces 20 years old, 20 years old, exactly the same that, that we were. And now we're all, you know, uh, different. Did you go straight from San Diego to Korea on the Klondike? Uh, actually, we were in Subic Bay, Philippines, when the war started. And from there, the Klondike was the only ship destroyer tended the whole Pacific. So from there immediately we went to uh, Pusan. Then we started repair because a repair ship, you know, the other ships, they tie up alongside and we repair them and the destroyer tenders, it's, it's a big ship and we, we have all kinds of things to repair all kinds of ships. So that, that's where we started. Now the, the Sphinx was a small repair ship. So most of them were uh, amphibious uh, ships that we repaired. But uh, we, we, we repaired a whole bunch. 
In fact, we used to, you know, uh, there were 22 nations that participated in the Korean War. And most of them uh, were, well, you know, United Nations. And we repaired British, Canadians, everything. I was, did you interact with any of the foreign soldiers, the other soldiers? Well, no, Navy. Like Navy men, yeah. sorry. Well, from we got repaired, then we used to talk back and forth and this and the exchange and uh, like the British, yeah, let's come over and you can have lunch with us or dinner or this or that and the other completely different uh, uh, food, you know. And one time, uh, there were some, uh, some small little frigates from Colombia. There were six. And at uh, one time, we, we, we had, it was a, a, a commander, admiral, over there, everybody was an admiral. Admiral, do, 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 then, or, or uh, this, 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 all kind of names, you know. And they invited us for, for dinner. So me, I was interpreter, the captain, and our engineering officer. So we go down there, and they serve us a common soup uh, uh, in a bowl. And it was dark, I never seen anything like that. I had no idea what it was. And now I found out that it was a bean soup. But it was the black beans, at that time, Black beans were all in South America. Now black beans are all over the place. And that's what it was, black bean soup. The funny thing about this, uh, this guys from Colombia, the ships, when they first tied up against us, I got up in the morning and said, gee, am I hearing things? I hear chickens and this and that and the other. In the back, they had a little coop. They had turkeys, chickens, pigs, See, when they stopped in the place, they used to buy those things and have them there. So we had that soup, we had roast chicken and rice. This is the first time that I uh, tasted, the rice was almost Spanish, but they had peas and carrots. I had never tasted uh, like that. Now, now sometimes they put in the rice, you know, little pieces of carrots and, and, and corn. But it's a great experience, you know. Yeah, how do you feel about your your role in that economic transformation? Do you feel that you played a part at all by being there? I feel that we saved South Korea. Like I say, we, we stopped communism. And uh, I just, uh, I really enjoyed it. It was a great experience. You're away from home and you're, I used to tell the guys this, look, just do what they tell you and you will not have any problems. But you cannot buck the system, no way. It's the Navy way and our way. So you do it the Navy way and that's it. And you have any, never have any problems. It was a great, great experience. And like I said, food <coughs> wouldn't have been for that. I wouldn't have been able to get an education too, which I really enjoyed the, the Did education. You? Yeah, I'm sure. Did your ship any ever see any combat, or no, because well, it was maintenance? Well, we had two experiences that I'll never forget, and I will not tell them because I want you to know about them. Uh, March 1952, never again. We were escorting two little mine sweepers. Those little mine sweepers are made out of wood because uh, the mines are attracted by the magnet on, on, on the iron. So there were two little mine sweepers, they were sweeping. It's one here, one here, and they have some cables and everything, and they drag them. They try to pick up the mines and explode them and things like that. And we were on the side to assist them if they need anything. <clears throat> because on both of those uh, little ships, there were two Americans teaching the North Koreans. It was a crew of about 15, and they were teaching because those uh, ships were going to turn over to, to South Korea. So on one of those little ships, somehow they, they couldn't start the engines anymore. And they had the same engines that we had, General Motors, which uh, we had some guys that were oh, good on that. So they asked for two volunteers, and two guys went over. So they were working out there, and I can't remember. Well, and then all of a sudden, about half an hour later, 
the biggest explosion I have ever seen in my in my whole life. They hit a mine. There was nothing left when everything came down. No smoke, just pieces of, of wood everywhere, and that was it. And then that explosion caused this other ship to, uh, their engine was thrown out of line, so it stopped. So we had to go in there because we had a cable in the back and drag that one out and take him out of the mine area. And then we, we left for Sasab or Pusan or something, and that was the, the end of that. But then for four, from three to five years after I got discharged, I had uh, flashbacks, nightmares. It, 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 they just didn't go away. And it, it, it lasted that long, and then it just kind of went away and once in a while. But uh, that was a, it, it's going to be here for the rest of my life. You know, I close my eyes and I see the guys just exactly they were. It's amazing how everything is, is up there. And the other incident that we had was uh, that same year in November, and I'll never forget that one either. We were going into harbor, and we were about the third ship in line, you know. You go in and you anchor or this or whatever. And then all of a sudden, a big explosion in the ship right in front of us. It was a destroyer. And it was a brush uh, a destroyer, and we knew. I knew that two guys from Laredo were there. Eww, I hope they didn't get hurt. The ship is like this, and that mine just cut everything just like this. The whole one third of the of the uh, front end blown out. So well, I hope there's the Laredo guys are okay. So two, three, four days later, we we went to the EM club where everybody gathers there, and. and uh, it was insensible. And uh, I see the two guys there. Hijo, what a joy. You know, every time you see somebody from your hometown, from your hometown, I said, we were lucky we were in the back, but there were 10 killed and 20, 30 injured. And that was, those were the two experiences that I had. All the others were just regular routine things that happened, you know. How, what was your experience like during the winter of 1950? Were you very cold all the time? Well, the ship that I was on, at that time the ship didn't have air condition. All it had was blowers. It used to just blow air, and we used to put on the steam. You know, we had a, a boiler and we had, we had to make steam for certain things that they use steam for. So they put the steam and the air just came out a little bit warmer. But I was an engine man, engineer, so, so we were down in the engine rooms all the time, so it didn't affect us much. But the 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 guys that used to uh, be on the top, you know, the seamen and they throwing the lines, they were up there. But uh, we had pretty close, uh, pretty good uh, winter clothing. Yeah. What was your happiest moment during the war? Gee, well, what can I tell you? Well, okay. Every time I went to some place and there was somebody from my hometown. San Diego was full. We had a place there for we all met. It was called the Mexican Village. The owner was a, a, a guy by the name of Sanchez and he was from McAllen, Texas. And all the guys who used to meet there, we used to leave notices and this and that and the other. Uh, we're going out for nine months or this month and whatever. And that, that was a great. And there were most of them Navy. We saw five or six um, uh, Marines, and even five or six guys that were on this uh, uh, merchant ships, which were civilian. There were two or three guys from Laredo on those ships, and we saw them there. I, somehow the the word got around. You want to see the guys from Laredo? Go to the Mexican village. And that was a great place. A great place there. After the war, did you go back to Laredo right away? Yes, I figured, well, after my discharge in March 1955 as well, I'm going to get an education. That was my first thing. So I went to Laredo. <coughs> All we had there was, at that time, was called Laredo Junior College. That was established in '46, especially for the veterans that were coming back from World War II. So I went there for two years. That was all they had. And then from there, I transferred to uh, Southwest Texas. 
that's in San Marcos, Texas. And I liked it because it was a small college, the tuition was great, and there were about 15 or 20 guys from Laredo there. So, so I went there, and uh, I think oh, I finished there in 1960. And I got a degree in a, a BA in business, and I got a minor in history. And so, and then the most frustrating thing is after you graduate, you can't find a job. I'll tell you that. Took me six months. Six months to find a job. How do you think that being in Korea and serving in Korea has affected your life? Well, in a way, we formed this organization 15 years ago. That was that, that, that's one of the things that I'm really proud of. Because we would like for everybody to know about the war, about the war, but just just like an interview. A lot of people don't know. What was that? When did it happen? There's a lot of people that they don't read the paper, they don't see the news, and they're they're in a complete blank, you know. They, they might have a little bit of an idea, but nothing. So we we form, we go to, to high schools, preferably to, to uh, <clears throat> for the seniors. The other guys won't pay any attention to you. They're all over the place. Seniors, we go to the college there, the, the junior college, and we go to the Tommy U. In fact, when I go back, I have to prepare a little, a little speech or something. I think Wednesday we're gonna go to, to Tommy U for a, we're gonna, a history class. And there are three guys, and we usually try to pick one from each. <clears throat> we had a Marine, but he just passed away, so we probably, we still have an officer. And he was in the Navy, myself, Navy, and maybe my partner, he was in the Army. And each one of us will talk there about 15, 20 minutes. Not even 60, I guess it was. So I said, uh, I had 24 hours in history, I want to go to the college. And, See, they have an opening for a, for a history class. So I went over there and the guy says, well, all the history classes are failed except one. And we're having a little hard time uh, getting somebody to teach that class. Well, what is it? What is it? Well, it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 6 in the afternoon to 8.30 at night. He says, well, I'm not doing anything. I'll take it. That was my, for 15 years, I really enjoyed that class. Why? 95% of the students were older people. They wanted to know about history. And the other 5% were students that were going to college, but somehow they couldn't fit in that history class. So that was my great experience. As a history teacher, how do you feel about how the Korean War is covered in schools? The history books no longer concentrate on, on, on these things, on, on war. They concentrate on politics, on this, on the problems that the United States has with this other country or this one. And if they mention things like that, it's just a little bit that, a little bit of a thing. They don't go into detail of this or that. Like uh, I used to tell them, okay, World War II, who were the Axis? The what? Axis? Germany, Japan, and Italy. Oh, we were the allies. All the others, they didn't know that. When did World War II start? It? Oh, it started December the 7th, 1941. No, that's when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Actually, World War II started September the 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Czechoslovakia and Poland. Because when Germany lost World War I, oh, Hitler never forgot that. I'm going to get even with you guys. And that's when it started. When did the Korean War start? Oh, it started with the Incheon invasion, September the 15, 1950, because that was, oh, the invasion, MacArthur and this and that. There was a MacArthur, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. He finally had a meeting with Truman in, in Hawaii, and they were convinced. MacArthur was the, the greatest military uh, strategist we have ever had. He was no good for politics. 
when uh, Truman fired him, he went to California and tried to run for some positions. Nothing. And uh, and I, I told him, actually, the Korean War started June the 25th, 1950. They, they, didn't, they didn't know about that. See, in history, three things have to occur in order to be a, a history event or whatever. How did this, here's two countries. What's going on with these two countries? Okay, they're having a big, big, big argument because this country wants this piece of land that used to belong to them. They want to have trade relations or this or that and the other. Or say then, what happened here? Or oh, they agreed to give the land, or they had a little war, and this and that and the other, and then what were the final results? So those three things have to be in there in order to be a good history uh, subject. What would you include from the Korean War, other than those three things, if you were to teach just the Korean War? Again, I go back to, we stopped communism, and uh, to me that's the greatest thing. Stop communism right there. Imagine if South Korea would be communist right now. We'd be in bad shape because Russia wanted to control everything. See, after World War II ended, the 30th parallel, they said, okay, Russia, you take north of the 38th, United States will control south of the 38th. If it wouldn't have been for that, we'd be in a big mess. Because Russia wanted to control everything. See, I don't know if you know this, but let me let me tell you what. Uh, when the Berlin Wall was broken up, Russia, all the the uh, republics, they went away, and Russia just stayed like this. Okay. Now China is the biggest country in the world. One third of the world's population is in China. I I, I get the National Geographic and in, uh, in 19 see 2010 they had the world census of all the world. China is the biggest land mass, one third of the population. The total population in the figure in the world at that time was about 7 billion. China, which has one-third of the land of the, of the whole world, was at 1 billion 600 million. 1 billion 600 million. India, number two, 1 billion 300 million. United States barely hit 300 million. So just imagine, if you think that we are crowded, but, but China has a lot of land mass. But 1 billion 600 million. I tell them, how much is 1 billion? 100 of these millions is one of these ones. Is that right? Five more times that we have is the population in China. You know, a lot of people, you go about maybe, they'll understand one million, but after that, and then you have your trillions, like the national debt that we have. It's a, the trillions, 14, 15 trillion dollars. Eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
And I think they'll have a, a lady president right now, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yes, they do. Yeah. President Park. I think in that book, on, on the first three pages, she's there to, to give it an introduction or something like that. Yeah. But I would tell you, to me, uh, Korea right now is the, the most progressive uh, country in the world. What do you think the legacy of the Korean War veterans is? What do you think the Korean War can teach future generations? History, history, history. A lot of people don't like history. Ah, that's past, I'm gone. That's past. But, but history was here, but now it, 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 it makes the future. You know, history goes on. History will never end. History is history, history, and it'll there, 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 there. You know, it's funny, a lot of people don't want to hear anything about wars or anything about death. Nothing like that. You know, I'm having a happy time, this and this and this and this. I don't care about this, who died, or who this, or no, that, or no, that. You shouldn't be. Do you support the reunification of a divided Korea? The reunification? Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think. I don't think the South wants it because of the way that... Look at the North Korea. This this guy, he's only, what, what 30 years old? He, he killed his uncle because he has something there. Him and his, his sister? Jesus. People are starving there. At one time, South Korea used to give them rice and rice and food and this, and then they stopped it. They didn't want to. Don't come back here anymore. Don't come back here no. We have enough. And they were dying and dying and dying. Now I think they're, they're starting again a little bit. But imagine in a country where thousands or I don't know how many die every day because of what? Starvation. And they refuse help from others. And I don't know. Just like those other countries, like we have, uh, that they're 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 building a uh, atomic things and this and arms and this. North Korea is the same. You never know when they probably have an atomic bomb. You never know when they use it. They're crazy. So that's the way it is. Do you have any messages for the young younger generations? Study history. <laughs> Study history, history. Yeah. Do you have any other? Uh... Ask questions. Yes. Ask questions. 